Our scripture reading for this evening's sermon is taken from uh, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 65. Before we hear from God's word, please join me in praying for his blessing upon the reading of this word, that our ears would be open, and on the preaching of this word, that our hearts would receive it. Our Father in heaven, we, we are glad to come before you again at the close of this day in worship, and we are glad to do so in the light of our risen Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray now that you would open our ears to hear your word, and that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word. We ask, O oh Father, that you would grant the Holy Spirit the power from on high to create faith and, and grow and mature faith within us, young and old, member and visitor. Oh, Father, you see our needs, and we, know, we pray that you would provide as you know best. In Jesus' name, amen. We read tonight from Isaiah 65, and we're going to read the, the whole thing. And um, after, being, after completing it, I hope that you'll keep your Bibles open, because uh, we're going to look at a number of passages this evening. Congregation, this is God's word. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a, re to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord, because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. Sharon shall become a pasture for flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for herds to lie down, for my people who have sought me. But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune and fill cups of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you to the sword, and all of you shall bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer." When I spoke, you did not listen, but you did what was evil in my eyes and chose what I did not delight in. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. Behold, my servants shall sing in gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart and shall wail for breaking of spirit. You shall leave your name to my chosen for a curse, and the Lord God will put you to death, but his servants he will call by another name, so that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth." And he who takes an oath in the land will swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, 
For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with him. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So far, the reading of his word. Please be seated. If you've been at Grace Church for a while, you know that um, I am fascinated by the study of natural sciences, Uh, not the uh, kind that goes off into philosophy and metaphysics, but rather the kind that stays in its lane. Those who... um, will observe and try to describe life as we know it. Some do so, um, you you know, through the smaller instruments like a microscope, looking at the smaller and the smallest things of life. And that is is indeed interesting, but my inclination is, is more along the lines of telescopes. The Hubble telescope, for example, the James Webb telescope, to look through them into our solar system and beyond our solar system to our galaxy and through it to the galaxies of the universe beyond is is an awesome thing. It's just simply awesome to see it and then to describe it. To describe it, however, I'm often left wanting for words. And I feel much the same while looking beyond the natural sciences into the supernatural things of Scripture, while looking to God through the lens of Scripture and light of of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is truly an awesome thing to behold the glory of our God. We've we've been doing our best to do so over the last weeks as we have been thinking about the glory of our God. There is one simple spiritual being whom we call God. And what did we confess tonight? But some some of his glory, of his eternity, of his incomprehensibility, of his infinity, his invisibility, his wisdom, his almighty power. Last week, Reverend File brought us to consider the goodness of God, the goodness of God himself, and the goodness of God through, through the works, especially the work of, of, of the gospel. Tonight, what we consider is how all of God, how all of that glory is is brought to us as his people as an overflowing fountain or the overflowing source of all that is good. That's our theme. Not just the goodness of God tonight, but, but the victory of God's goodness. The ultimate victory of God's goodness and, and that is first promised to us, well, as you might imagine, it's first promised to us at the beginning of the Bible. 
This is first promised to, to us, this victory, this ultimate victory of the goodness of God is promised to us already in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, the Garden of Eden. If you think about Genesis 1, the stage is set, isn't it? As, as God proceeds to create all things out of nothing by the word of his power in the space of six days. There was the first day and the second day, the third and the fourth day, day as God entered the chaos and spoke into the void and he made all things good. And kids, you remember, it wasn't just that he made the moon and the stars, the earth, the birds and bees, the beasts of the field and and men and women, it's not just that he made all things good, but that he made all things very good. Very good. However, it wasn't long before God's celebration of his glory and his goodness turns into a lamentation of evil. God's celebration of very good becomes a lamentation. <laughs> Adam, what have you done? What have you done? And, and, and what follows then, in the verses that follow in Genesis 3, what we find is, is the very thing symbolized in the, in the two trees, the tree of knowledge and good and evil and the tree of life spoken to as, as God speaks judgment against evil, and God at the same time promises a greater good, a good that would be a full embodiment and realization of that tree of life. That's the promise. The promise of God's ultimate victory already at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, in the Garden of Eden, the celebration, the lamentation, looking forward to a consummation that would, that would come. But in our second point tonight, we, may, we make the observation that, that this, this promised victory was delayed. The promised victory of God's goodness was delayed. Uh, delayed and, and further envisioned, further envisioned or revealed by the prophets. If you're taking notes, uh, there it is. Our second point, uh, this promised victory of God was delayed and then envisioned, further revealed by the prophets, by the prophets. Um, we could, you just pick your prophet and, and you've got it. That what the ha what's happening in the prophets is they're taking from the, the earlier revelation of God and his word from Genesis and Exodus through the, throughout the law of Moses, the historical books. The prophets are drawing from that, from that word and, and, and the Holy Spirit's inspiring them to envision the fulfillment of it all. The fulfillment of it all in a day that was still to come. So take, for example, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known for envisioning the day when God would establish a new covenant with his people. And how about Ezekiel? Ezekiel is well known for us for envisioning a day when God himself would come, when God himself would act, and he would remove the evil heart of stone, and he would sovereignly create a new heart of flesh filling his people with the Holy Spirit that they might know him and love him and obey him. And as if that prophetic vision of Ezekiel wasn't enough, we have the valley of dry bones. Do you remember? Where the prophet is commanded to preach to those dry, dead bones. But why, Lord? <laughs> They're dead. Ah, don't underestimate the power of my word and spirit. And so the prophet preaches. And what happens? The breath, the spirit of God comes and, and brings new life to a multitude of those who were dead. Envisioning a resurrection. 
a day of resurrection still to come. We could go on to the other prophets, but for the sake of time tonight, I want to focus just briefly on our scripture reading, Isaiah chapter 55, and how the prophet there is uh, singing a song or bringing a poem to God's people that has two parts. The first part is speaking about judgment against all that is sinful and satanic and evil. And the second part is speaking about a coming day of redemption. A coming day of redemption. One of my favorite Old Testament professors, teachers, uh, Alec Matier, has a commentary on Isaiah. And, and what he sees here is, is how Isaiah uh, 65 is, is not so much about the first coming of the promised Savior, certainly related to that, but, but mostly focused in on the second coming of the Savior, the second coming, the glorious return of Jesus Christ when he would fully and finally bring about the promised victory of of all that is good. Matier further comments on on the text, focusing in uh, not on the first part now of judgment, but the second part of promised promised redemption, verses 13 and following. Um, he, He gives this. I want to share it with you because I found it so helpful. Mate explains that Isaiah, in this vision, or in in this prophetic word, Isaiah uses aspects of present life to create impressions of the life that is still to come. Taking from the creation of Genesis 1, the world that's become very familiar to Israel and to us, He's using those things and he's looking forward to a creation that will come. Isaiah uses aspects of our present life to create impressions of the life that is still to come. It will be a life totally provided for, totally happy, totally secure, and totally at peace. Things we have no real capacity to understand can be expressed only through things we know and things we experience. So it is that in this present order of things, death cuts life off. In our present experience, death cuts life off before it has well begun or before it is fully matured, right? Sometimes the young die. Sometimes those who just enter the golden years find those years cut short. But the prophet says, the prophet envisions, it will not be so then. Matthieu goes on to explain from the text, no infant will fail to enjoy life. No elderly person will come to a short, uh, will come short of a total fulfillment Indeed, one would be, put, be but a youth were one to die uh, at age 100 years old. This does not imply that death will still be present in what is to come, but rather affirms that over the whole of life, as we should now say from infancy to old age, The power of death will be destroyed. He concludes saying that death will be no more and sin will have no presence. For Satan will not only be exposed and defeated, he will be finally destroyed under the wrath and just judgment of God. This ultimate victory of God's goodness promised and further envisioned was then finally inaugurated. If we think about that vision of Isaiah and of the other prophets, where do we see, let's say, the the reality of that any more clearly than in Jesus Christ? All that All that Isaiah was envisioning becomes a reality in in the very person of Jesus Christ. You see, that's why the angels, think about Luke 2, kids. Why do the angels celebrate the birth of Jesus? 
glory to God in the highest. Well, first and foremost, because Jesus is an exact imprint of God's own nature. The attributes of God, which we have been reflecting upon, were embodied by Christ himself as the eternal word became carnate. The angels celebrate that, and even more, they celebrate because in the person and work of Jesus Christ, sin would be dealt with, conflict brought to an end, and peace would be established. What the angels were already celebrating, and maybe they didn't know the full extent of it. In fact, they probably didn't. But they knew it wouldn't end in death. The angels knew the promises and the visions of the Old Testament, and they were celebrating that in the coming of Jesus, those things had become a reality, at least in Jesus himself. It couldn't be more clear as Jesus rises from the dead that he has become the first fruits of the new creation. And you see something that would not only be for him, but something, a reality that would be for those throughout the world. Luke 24, we heard from this morning, remember? Jesus comes to the disciples. He opens their minds to understand the scriptures, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms. And he says to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise again from the dead. Why? so that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Only repentance? Only freedom from sin? What about freedom from Satan? What about freedom from the curse of death? Ah, yes. (laughs) That as well. Every bit as much as Jesus was free from the power of sin and Satan and the curse of death through resurrection, that's the good news of the gospel for all who believe. There will be the the same sharing of new creation glory. Acts 3 verse 19, remember the apostle Peter, he's now filled with the Holy Spirit. He's just just miraculously healed the the lame man and everybody's celebrating. He takes it as a special opportunity to preach a sermon, one that shook the world. He he says in Acts 3, verse 19, to the people, as you see these things take place in your midst, repent, turn away from your sins, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Jesus already came. But you see, just as the prophets envisioned, they're looking through the first coming of Jesus and in that light to what is still to come. Repent that he may send the Christ appointed to you whom heaven and earth must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. We may not talk about that quite as much as the apostles did, and maybe we should, but you see, the call to repentance and the forgiveness of sins was but a taste, was but a taste of the restoration of all things that was still to come. Just as was promised, just as it was envisioned and prophesied, Jesus himself inaugurates through his resurrection through the resurrection from the dead. Another teacher writes that in the resurrection we have the presence of the future. In the resurrection of Jesus, the the future glory of the heavenly kingdom breaks into our present experience. The power which by, by which God will finally destroy all suffering, evil, deformity, and death at the end of time has broken into history now and is available. Yes, partially, but still substantially now. 
when we unite with the risen Christ by faith, that future power that is potent enough to remake the universe comes into us, believing Christians as well. It is awesome. It is awesome to look to God through the lens of Scripture and the light of Christ and behold not only His glory, but the glorious victory He has for all that is good. And it's a victory that is already experienced by the church today through faith. Isn't that what we've been hearing? This victory of God's goodness through the gospel of Jesus Christ is a victory that is already experienced through the church today in faith. Romans chapter 8, verse 22 gives a, a, a pretty compelling summary of this. The apostle writes that, that for the creation was subjected to futility, Thinking back now to Genesis 3, all creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together through and in the, in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, of course, but we ourselves, we who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of new creation, we too groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. the forgiveness of sins with a sure and certain hope that there is eternity to come. I'm 51 years old, and what that means, kids, is I wake up in the morning and I feel aches and pains, and I groan. I'm like, ugh. Lord, thank you. We've had but a taste. It's all we've had so far but a taste of the ultimate victory of his goodness. The Apostle Paul says something like that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, when he says, I have been crucified with Christ and now I, I no longer live. I no longer think of my life as having any value. Why? Because now Christ lives within me. Now that's a personal testimony of power. In Ephesians chapter 1, he applies it, at least in part, to us. Speaking about the mystery of God's will, the mystery of that, that first promise of victory, the mystery of the prophetic vision of victory, the mystery of how Jesus came to bring about an already but not yet fulfillment of that, the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he has set forth in Christ as a plan, a plan, now a specific plan, a design that is looking forward to the fullness of time. What is that plan? The fullness that's still to come in the future. It is to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, church, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Christ, you too were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit the first fruits of Christ's resurrection, the first fruits of new creation shared with you and me even now. 
And how about Colossians chapter 1, celebrating the preeminence of Christ, the preeminence of Christ not only over everything, as I think Abraham Kuyper spoke of, every square inch, I think we can do one better. The preeminence of Christ in everything. He says it's mine already, even if not yet fully. And we're, we're drawn up into that with Jesus. Uh, Colossians 3 verse 1 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died. See, Paul's testimony, my testimony. Your testimony. You have died with Christ. And now your life is hidden with Christ in God. We see through the lens of Scripture in light of Jesus, but how how do we describe the glory that is presented to us? Again, another teacher writes that the kingdom of God is already here, but not yet in its fullness. We must not underestimate how the present, how present the kingdom of God is now, but we must also not underestimate how unrealized it is, how much it exists only in the future, because the kingdom is present partially, but not fully. We must expect substantial healing, but not total healing in all areas of life. The groans are going to continue. Difficult visits with the doctor are going to continue. Strife within hearts and homes are going to continue. Because the, the, the victory of God's kingdom is, is, is an already ready, present reality for us through faith in Jesus Christ. But as we keep saying, there is so much more to come. There is so much more to come. Just briefly, I need to give credit where credit is due here. Pastor and teacher John Stott thinks about applying this to Christians, saying that because because the promised victory of God's kingdom has already come for us in Christ, we know the truth. We know the truth as Christians. And yet, there's a lot we don't know. So we can be confident in the truth we've been given. And we should be humble living with broken-hearted boldness and recognition that there's a still a whole lot out there that we haven't been told. Stott goes on to say that this affects our personal experience of change because we have been called into a faith union with Jesus because that is a very personal and vital union with Christ Himself. There will be change within us. The sense of of true freedom from the guilt of sin. The sense of really being sanctified from from the power of sin within us. A growing confidence that, that Satan may be a mighty and roaring lion, but he is nothing to the word of Christ. One little word shall fell him. There's real personal change, but let us not become too bold boasting somehow in ourselves, boasting somehow in um, all that we have accomplished, reflecting quietly or publicly upon just what is happening, you know, in our home or our church. No, we boast in Christ and the cross. 
counting ourselves as nothing. The same is true with, with church change, right? There is real meaningful change to a church that comes into union with Jesus and celebrates the gospel and shares the power of the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, as a church, we can't ever stop. We can't ever think that we've made a, a, a moment of peace as if victory has already been consummated for us. We must live every day vigilantly. The first duty of ministers, elders, and deacons, you know what it is? It's to continue in prayer. Why? Because every day we live in dependence upon the grace of our God. We can't cease for a moment lest we fall. You know many have fallen. Ministers, elders, deacons, congregants, Christians, churches, many fall. Change is real, and yet it's but a slow progress to what, what God has intended for us in the consummation. And this, our fifth and final point, we conclude this promised victory of God's goodness will be consummated. A consummated reality, universal reality, when Christ returns in glory. This victory will become a consummated universal reality when Christ returns in glory. That's the ultimate vision of the prophet, isn't it? The ultimate vision of Isaiah 65, not so much the first coming of Jesus, but rather through that to anticipate the second coming of Jesus' glorious return. Until then, uh, when things go well, we praise our God. When things go well, we thank Him for the expression of his love and the abounding of his grace within our lives. And when things go against us, when things go against us, as another minister reflected to me, with me just recently, maybe we shouldn't be quite as surprised. And in those moments, especially in those moments, we bring our cares and our concerns to Jesus. When things go against us, we bring our cares and our concerns to the cross. And we do so in light of the resurrection, the living hope of glory. It was already promised at the beginning of the Bible, envisioned throughout the Old Testament, embodied by Christ himself, developed and applied by the prophets and until it brings us to where the Bible ends. Revelation 21, the sweet words, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bridegroom adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Behold, our God is at work and he is making all things new. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for we thank you for your word and that through it we can look as, as through a telescope or maybe a microscope 
that through your word we can see the hidden things of our heart exposing the sin and evil within. We can see the smallest, seemingly smallest things through your word, and we can see the greatest and most glorious things of your word. And we pray that we would we'd see these tonight all in light of Jesus Christ, and that we would be drawn close to, closer to you in him through faith, that we would come to share more and more of your love, and that through faith the Holy Spirit would grant the increased abounding of your grace so that we too would increasingly be transformed from one glory to another. Grant us assurance, O Father, that in the meantime, you are working all things for our good. An ultimate victory, a magnification of your glory, and a day still to come. All oh, that our faith, our thoughts, and our hearts may dwell there with you even now. For Jesus' sake.